Hi there, my name's Naomi Thompson. I'm one of the lecturers in philosophy uh, at the University of Southampton. And what I want to do today is to chat to you a little bit about something which is on the one hand kind of familiar and ordinary, and on the other hand, when we start looking at it philosophically, really quite strange and quite hard to make sense of. And that thing is the notion of possibility, possibility and necessity. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about modal talk, which is sentences about how things have to be uh, and how things might be. And then we'll look at this notion of possible worlds, which philosophers use to model modal talk. OK, so modal talk is talk about, as I said, possibility and necessity. That's to say how things might be and how things must be. So let's just have a look at what we mean by a modal statement, look at a couple of these modal sentences. So modal sentences are sentences like, Boris Johnson might not have become Prime Minister, nothing can be both round and a square, pigs might fly, necessarily 2 plus 2 equals 4. So some of those sentences are about ways that things might be or might not have been, and others are about ways that things have to be or are required to be. Now, in order to understand the problem that I'm going to uh, talk about, I think it's interesting first to think about how we account for our ordinary sentences that aren't about uh, how things have to be or how things might have been, but rather are just about how things are. So uh, these are our non-modal statements. So here are some examples. So when we say a sentence like Naomi is a philosophy lecturer, how is it that we find out whether that's true or not? Well, it looks like we know what we need to do. We need to go and find Naomi and see what she does for a living. Or consider a sentence like apples always fall to the ground when dropped. So what would we need to do in order to check whether that sentence is true or false? Well, one thing we could do is find all of the apples and drop them. That's a pretty inefficient way of finding out whether the sentence is true or not. But it seems that we can at least say what it would take to find out if the sentence were true or not. And realistically, what we do is appeal to the scientific laws that account for the truth of that sentence. Finally, take a sentence like Keir Starmer will be prime minister. Now, it doesn't look as though we can just kind of check and see whether Keir Starmer is Prime Minister or not, because this is a sentence about the future. But again, we seem to know what it would take uh, in order to find out whether the sentence is uh, going to be true or false. We just need to wait long enough, see whether Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister before he dies or not, right? And that would be a way to check um, whether or not Keir Starmer will be Prime Minister is true or false. So, we've got this kind of distinction between um, these two kinds of sentences, the descriptive sentence about, to sent sentences about the way that the world is or will be at in the, in the, on the one hand, <laughs> and on the other hand, these modal sentences about things, how things must be or might, or how about how things must be or might have been. And now, it seems as though it's going to be much harder to give an account of what makes the sentences, the modal sentences, true or false, because it's not the case that we can just kind of go and find the relevant thing in the world, right? So if you want to find out um, whether Naomi might have been a dentist, it doesn't look as though you can just go and find out what Naomi actually does, because the sentence Naomi might have been a dentist isn't about the way that things are in the actual world, right? It's a sentence about possibility. And so it doesn't look as though there's an easy way for us to sort of look at the world and find out whether these sentences about what might have been or what must be are true or false. Because similarly, uh, it's not enough to see that a sentence is necessarily true just to see that it's true, right? So if we find uh, that Naomi is a philosophy lecturer is true um, in this world, that doesn't tell us anything about whether Naomi had to be a philosophy lecturer, right? Um, and so again, sentences about the way that the world is or ways of finding out whether sentences are true or false uh, aren't, aren't sufficient in, in the familiar way to tell us um, whether sentences about what has to be or what might have been are true or false. So what do we do? Well, philosophers appeal to this kind of device 
of talking in terms of possible worlds. So what uh, are we doing here? So possible worlds are ways of modelling possibility and necessity. So we can model our talk about possibility and necessity by appeal to possible worlds. What kinds of things are those? Well, let's first talk about just how uh, this notion of appealing to possible worlds is supposed to work. So we have this intuition that there really are modal facts, facts about how things might have been and how things must be. And those aren't facts about how things really are, right? And so we need some way to represent these facts. And as I said, philosophers represent these facts in terms of possible worlds. So in order to do that, we just take the sentences that we looked at before and we give them what's called a possible worlds translation. So take the sentence, pigs might fly. We make sense of that by saying that there is a possible world at which pigs fly. Necessarily, two plus two equals four. At all possible worlds, two plus two equals four. Boris Johnson might not have been prime minister. There is at least one possible world at which Boris Johnson is never prime minister. A comforting thought, you might think. OK, um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what kinds of things these possible worlds might be. So according to the position called genuine modal realism, all possible worlds really exist. So this is a position according to which every way things could possibly be is a way that some world is. And each world is actual for its inhabitants. So just as our world now is actual for us, our world is perfectly real, we can move around it. Um, ours is the world uh, from which the other worlds count as, me as, as, as merely possible, right? Um, at every world, every possible world, that's how the people at that world feel and how they talk about it. So our world is, is just possible um, relative to some other world at which uh, that world is actual, okay? So it's kind of a little bit hard to, hard to express, but the idea is that these possible worlds are not just uh, devices for us to talk about possibility and necessity, rather all of these worlds really actually exist. They're spatio-temporally isolated universes um, at which things are happening. Wild idea, right? So uh, let's talk about some arguments for why you might think this slightly crazy sounding thing. So um, one of the main arguments for thinking about possible worlds in this way is that we get this full description of, full kind of reduction of modal talk to descriptive talk. So it means that we start out with one of these kind of problematic sentences about way that th ways that things might have been or, or must have been, and we're able to translate it into something that sounds totally descriptive. And as we saw earlier, when we have a descriptive sentence, like Naomi is a philosophy lecturer, we, can, we know how to go about working out whether that sentence is true or false. So when we get now a modal sentence, like Naomi might have been a dentist, all we need to do is have a look at the possible worlds, and if we can find one at which Naomi is a dentist, then we know that our sentence, Naomi might have been a dentist, is true. So we've got a way to work out whether, or to, to kind of model what it takes for our sentences about possibility and necessity to be true or false. And this is a kind of simple and elegant solution to the problem. So uh, we've kind of been able to make make use of the way that we ordinarily think about the truth or falsity of our sentences and kind of find a way to apply it even when we're talking about this kind of tricksy modal case and that's kind of attractive. Um, but it's not all plain sailing so it looks like there were also some pretty serious problems with this way of thinking. So this is the main argument against some people think the main argument against this kind of view is just that it sounds so crazy, right? And this objection is sometimes called the incredulous stare. So just imagine what it takes to believe that there really are all of these universes 
existing alongside our universe that we can never kind of access, we can never directly um, have any interaction with. And there are just so many of them that they represent, they, they are <laughs> every single way that anything might possibly be, right? That's just so many universes and it's just so much stuff, so much more stuff than we thought there was because there isn't just our universe. There's all of these possibilities. Every single way that anything might be really is a way that things are somewhere at some possible world. And that's just, that's just wild, right? Think about it for a moment. Okay, and closely related is the idea that this is a seeming really big violation of parsimony. So philosophers often say that one of the virtues of a th philosophical theory um, is when it is parsimonious, when it doesn't multiply entities beyond necessity, when it keeps things as simple as possible. And so one of the ways that that play plays out is in trying not to be committed to kind of the existence of huge numbers of things. And when it comes to genuine modal realism, it seems as though we really are committed to huge numbers of things. We've just said that there are all of these worlds out there. And that's a massive violation, you might think, of parsimony. But here's an interesting thought. So David Lewis, who champions this genuine modal realism, has argued that in fact, there is on, on another way of thinking and on the way of thinking that he thinks is more important, Genuine modal realism is not uh, unparsimonious. It doesn't violate this idea that we should keep things simple because we know that we inhabit a world in space and time, right? Uh, and what Lewis is saying is that all of the other worlds are really just like ours. So whilst we have to recognise that there are huge numbers of these things, they're all kind of in some ways quite similar to our world because they're all concrete objects, right? And uh, as we'll see in a moment, the other ways of thinking about possibility, you might think commit you to sort of stranger things. So at least uh, Lewis is keeping it simple in the sense that he's not introducing any new kinds of objects. These possible worlds are just like our world. So in one sense, it's not really unparsimonious at all. Okay. Finally, you might worry about epistemology. So epistemology is uh, questions about how we know things. And you might worry that if all of these possible worlds exist out there, spatio-temporarily isolated from us, they're not things that we could ever um, get to travel to or anything like that. And they're also not things that could have any causal effect on our knowledge because they're isolated from us in space and time and causation happens in space and time. Uh, then you might think it's not really possible for us to get to know what's going on at those possible worlds. And if that's the case, then we haven't really solved our original problem, because our original problem was to be able to explain what could be making our sentences about possibility and necessity true and false. And maybe if those worlds are having no kind of, if we have no way of knowing what's going on at those worlds, then we're no better off than we were when we started. Now again, Lewis has a response to this kind of worry and he thinks that we can get to know what's going on at all these other possible worlds by recombining things uh, that we see at our actual world, at the actual world for us. So uh, when we want to know whether it's possible that Naomi might have been a dentist, um, we think about Naomi and we think about the property of being a dentist and it seems like there's nothing to stop us putting those things together and so we can know that there is a possible world at which Naomi is a dentist. But if we take being round and being a square, say, and we try to recombine things so that those things go together, that doesn't make any sense. And so we think that there isn't a possible world at which something can be both round and a square. Okay. So those are some brief arguments against genuine modal realism. And I just want to finish by talking about a couple of alternatives. So if you don't think that that sounds attractive, what can you stay instead? So here are two kind of prominent alternatives to genuine modal realism. One is to say that only the actual world is concrete and all of the others are abstract. So remember we were talking about Lewis on parsimony and I said that one thing Lewis can say is that all of the other worlds, according to him, 
are quite like our world in the sense that they are spatio-temporal. They happen inside space and time. They are kind of places where space and time um, happen. <laughs> now, according to this alternative, other possible worlds are abstract. They exist outside of space and time. And so there's a sense in which that's even more unparsimonious because not only are there all these things that exist, but they exist outside of space and time. On the other hand, you might think uh, that's not such a cost in terms of just prima facie, on the face of it, weirdness, um, because it's not the case that these things exist in space and time, right? Instead, they're abstract, like things like maybe numbers are abstract, and maybe that's sort of less weird because we don't have to find space uh, for these things to exist. The final alternative is to think of possible worlds talk as just a sort of useful fiction. So just as when you say, according, well, just as when you say Harry Potter is a wizard, what you really mean is something like, according to the Harry Potter stories, Harry Potter is a wizard. And that means that you're not committed to the literal existence of wizards, right? Because you only think that it's true according to some kind of fiction. The fictionalist about possible worlds, which is this final view, can say that talk about possible worlds uh, is really just a useful fiction. It's only true according to the sort of story uh, of possible worlds. And that way they can use the devices that the genuine modal realist uses in order to model possibility and necessity, to model modal talk, uh, but without being committed to the actual sort of genuine existence of uh, these these things, these possible worlds. Now, that's attractive because it avoids this unparsimonious commitment to all these extra things, um, but you might think it's a little bit of, of a cop-out uh, because we're just sort of using the benefits of that theory, um, but sort of shirking out of the, of the costs, and it's not totally clear that that's really legitimate. Okay, so now we've had a quick sort of run through of what the options are, how the genuine modal realist thinks, what motivates their view, and the kind of problems that there might be with their view. And we've looked at a couple of alternatives. And I think really it's hard to come to much more of a kind of uh, definite conclusion than that this notion of modality, which we use all the time, which is really familiar, is also extremely mysterious. So thanks very much uh, for listening and I hope you enjoyed this brief discussion. Thanks.